regular speakers. Um, just driver integration can change. Um, concentric driver, not so much. Um, so you can come in near field and still get good integration between all the parts, mm. and so it will work in the near field. There'll be a subtle balance change. It'll get sound a bit richer mm -hmm. uh, as you get closer. Um, but again, it won't be affected too much. Because uh -huh. you know, I've been experimenting recently with near field with various speakers and not with them near a wall, but way out into the room yeah. and me getting really close to the speakers. Right. And that, that was amazing to me. Because um, it, it's, it's, like it's counterintuitive. The closer you get to the speakers, the more they disappear. Because mm -hmm. there's fewer and fewer reflections around them. And it's just incredible. And mono, I'm not a mono guy, but when I heard mono near field with the speakers in the middle of the room, it was incredible. This, the depth that people talk about from mono. I was like, yeah, now I'm finally, I understand what they're talking about. It was incredible. Well, if you think about it, the room sort of is the enemy like we started mm -hmm. discussing. So how do you eliminate the room? You either treat the room or you get closer. Because you've got near field and far field, and you've got in that far field, in a room, you know, the sound pressure drops as you move away from the speaker. And if you're in outdoors, it'll just continue dropping. The further away, the quieter. But once you get into the reverberant field in a room, the sound level stays constant no matter where you are. Okay. Which means the closer you get to the speaker, the lower the relative level of that reverberant field. Right. That reverberant field, it has a masking effect. It's like having too much noise in a recording. Quiet sounds disappear into the noise floor. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Quiet sounds disappear in the reverberant field because that reverberant field is the past history of the music you've been playing. Right, right. right? So you come to a quiet bit, and you know, there's still a bit right, of it's lingering. lingering. Yeah, and always there's some lingering noises. So the closer you are to the speaker, all of that disappears. Mm -hmm. And it will be more like listening on headphones. Yeah. Because headphones don't have a room. And there always seems to be a lot more detail in headphones. You think, the driver in a headphone costs a dollar. <laughs> How can it sound as good as speakers at hundreds and thousands of dollars. Right. Because you've taken the room out is right. one answer. And, and no crossover. And no crossover and uh, doesn't have to move far and all this kind of stuff. Operating at the milliwatt level. Um, but you get that sense more in the near field of right. that effect. It's, yeah. it's pretty remarkable. Yeah. And lots of studios these days, or most studios, you've, you've got the big monitor speakers, the software mounted speakers in the wall at the back. Nearly every studio now also has a midfield monitor, which will be a bigger, well, smaller than the software right. mounts, but a, a big speaker up on a stand to get it above the desk. Then you'll have your desktop right. monitors, which sometimes are the worst of the three. Right. The right. Well, the smallest at least. And but they're the closest. But they yes. do have the reflection of the desk. But they have the reflection of the desk. Yes. Yeah. No, I'm fascinated by that. I mean. Would you ever want to design specifically a near field, like a desktop speaker with that in mind? Just for near field? Can't answer that one. Sorry. That means yes. <laughs> I take that as a yes. Um, so what, what do you see like the most typical problems that people you know, have with room set up for, for their speakers? Now, I, I, I have to be careful here from a point of view appearing to sound elitist or anything. Oh, well, that's OK. But I do among pictures. friends. I see pictures on forums. Uh -oh. And I look at how a lot of people have placed their speakers and what rooms they're in. And you go, I don't know why I'm trying. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. Now, that's why it sounds elitist. I, I really don't want to kind of be like that. Oh, you said it. It's done. But it's, <laughs> and it's, it's on, The damage is done. The reality is, we, as audiophiles, we are elitist. Right? Uh, I said snob we, the other day. That didn't go over too well. Okay. <laughs> we think we know more about sound than everybody else. And you can say we have experience of it. But we want to take care of what we're doing. And we are going to try and optimize every part of it. Unfortunately, a lot of what 
needs to be done to optimise a speaker in a room. No one's, a lot of people just either don't know enough to do that or don't have the opportunity to do that. You see some of these things where there's a room and there's a big open entrance to the next room. So the speakers uh -huh. can't go out that way because they'll be in the way of walking through to the next room. But there's a corner here. So uh -huh. one speaker's in the corner, one is out here. Uh -huh. And they're like this far apart. And unfortunately, that's how a lot of people have to listen. Mm. So really, it gets back to that first thing. Am I dis what environment am I designing for? Right. What can you compensate for? Can I make for? it tolerant right. yeah. to unusual environments? Um, that's the more difficult aspect of it. Um, imagining what different environments could it be in and can I do something about mm. that? And then you look at, well, should I be using room EQ to fix some of these problems? And there's dangers in doing room EQ. Mm. Um, simple room EQ can fix some obvious problems that you can't necessarily comfortably get around in a home. Mm. But conceptually, I always have a problem. There is ways of fixing rooms with speakers and signal processing, but speakers, not just your two speakers. Uh -huh. Conceptually, the speaker launches a perfect sound wave. Perfect. Like just oh, okay. I'm going with the flow here. Okay, okay. Launches it into the room. You hear that first launch. Then some time later, it's going to come back to you. Yeah. And it's that coming back uh -huh. that you want to fix. Uh -huh. How, so conceptually, how on earth does changing the signal you're putting into the speaker mm -hmm. to screw up that first launch <laughs> to fix the <laughs> things that's coming back to you? What you really should be doing is putting another, conceptually, put another pair of speakers behind you, fed, delayed, out of phase, and attenuated. So as that wave reaches them, yeah. they output a wave of exactly the opposite, and nothing ever comes back to you. Have you done that? Lots of people have. I've, I've experimented. <laughs> okay, okay. There's lots of published papers of doing this, and uh. how many do you need in which dimensions to get to make it work but, up to high enough frequencies. And of course, it's only in the sweet spot as you move away. No, it will, that will now work for every point between those two sets of speakers. You'll always get really? perfect. So as you get launch. closer to the back speakers, you're still? Yes. OK. Oh, OK. But now what we're doing is saying. Look, well, you're selling more speakers. Well, yes. Oh, see, so there's. But we've just said these people couldn't place two speakers well enough. Now I'm asking them to fix it by placing even more. Oh. Right? So, yeah. right? so, although I can argue conceptually about this, I can't deny that some EQ can fix obvious problems and will be better than, in that instance, better okay. than nothing. Um, the more complex scene. When you're talking about home theatre and you're talking about a 5.1, or 7.1, 9.1, you've now got lots of extra speakers. So mm. these things like Dirac and all these very complex DSP-based approaches to fixing room acoustics are doing it because, kind of in a theoretical sense, <coughs> they've got all these other speakers they can play with to put sounds out, mm. to cap, let's say, to capture some of those okay. later sounds. But would uh, a bare floor is a, is a major no-no in front of the speakers, at least? Yes, um, because you've got a, a direct floor bound that's very obvious. Now, that's one of the differences between in a room when you listen to a bookshelf speaker versus the tower. Uh -huh. So let's take where I've done one woofer versus three woofers. One woofer, reflection from the floor, it'll interfere with the direct sound and give you a dip typically around 200 hertz. And higher up, but there's that first dip. Call that the floor bounce. When you take a tower speaker with multiple drivers at different heights, each has got a different dip frequency. Mm -hmm. And the lower, the closer to the ground, the further in frequent, higher in frequency that dip moves. Mm -hmm. So that kind of fills in the dip of the others. And each okay. fills in to some extent. So that dip is reduced in magnitude and kind of spread out. So it's smoother. So it's smoother. Mm -hmm. um, so, Tonally, that's 
what's left of why the bookshelf might not sound identical to the tower. Ah. Even if I measured anechoically far oh. enough away, they would measure the same. Once they interface into the room, they won't interface identically. Well, just to finish that, my idea on the on the putting a rug or carpeting, mm -hmm. does the thickness of the rug in terms of absorption well, help? So or? you've got that first reflection. Yeah. But that's at a frequency where a rug will not really absorb much. Okay. The rug is more for the higher frequencies. Okay. They, they it will still bounce to you. Um, it'll be lots of fuzz. Mm -hmm. say, um, and so the rug will help with that. But always when you're doing room treatment, especially with absorption, you've got to be careful. Mm -hmm. It's easy to absorb high frequencies, not easy to absorb mid frequencies, and very difficult to absorb low frequencies. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you're putting absorbers around can be wrong. It's unbalancing the reverberant sound field mm -hmm. of the room, uh, making it dull in one range, it sounds duller initially, mm. and you don't notice that it hasn't really done the mid-range. Okay. But when you start listening, oh, this doesn't sound right, so you have to be careful with that. You have to have a mixture of diffusion and absorption. Right. But even diffusers don't work down to very low frequencies. So it's back to size matters. Oh no, Everything. I wasn't good at that. <laughs> so uh, I think we're time for you guys to speak up, ask uh, Answer the questions or me. I doubt I'll be as good, but uh, right. let's go. I just even heard of speakers that have a single full range driver that goes from, let's say, 20 hertz to 10,000 hertz. What are the challenges of that type of design? And other than that, I wondered what the specific need was for the development of your concentric driver. Okay. First difficulty in understanding about that is believing that a single full-length driver covers <laughs> 20 hertz to beyond 10k. They just don't, and not at any appreciable level. That's why, you know, the, let's say the, the perfect physics is one driver that covers the whole frequency range, but physics prevents that happening, um, especially if you're on wide dispersion at the top end and all these other factors. Um, but certainly people attempt to do full-range drivers, but a full-range driver will in a cabinet won't have a flat response either. So you either like the non-flat response or you put some EQ in. It's not a crossover, but it's crossover type components to try and equalize it to be flatter. Um, but what drove the idea of concentric drivers? Um, you know, I was at KEF when we developed Unify. UniQ, UniQ. No, no. UniQ. Um, We'd all been read, there were papers published, Daniel Queen had published this paper about the, the last frontier in speaker design is directivity control. And so how do you do that? As soon as you separate two drivers, you're left with three problems. Um, physically separated means harmonics are coming from here and maybe fundamentals from here. And since we can perceive height, then the sound source is kind of split apart. Subtle, but it's there. Secondly, phase relationships between the two drivers in the crossover region change as you stand up and sit down. So you get peaks and dips. Um, thirdly, directivity characteristics of a big woofer and a small tweeter are totally different. So at the crossover point, the woofer has become directional, the tweeter hasn't. So if you're designed to be flat on axis, it will not and cannot be flat off axis. So how do you fix that? Well, uh, Tannoy had addressed this many years earlier with their dual concentric. Have a horn loaded tweeter fire through the pole piece of the bass driver and use the woofer cone as a horn, as a waveguide. Now we've got a concentric type driver. Um, there was a problem that it's delayed with respect to the woofer. You know, it's like four inches behind the woofer coil, so that has its problems. Um, but nonetheless, that addresses that issue because now being on the same axis and height, you don't get that pulling apart, you don't get phase differences, you move around the speaker through the crossover point, and you've now modified the directivities so they match through the crossover point. So now, with a good concentric type design, whether it's the type I do where... You do the good ones. No. Okay. 
where you put the tweeter on top of the pole piece and you know the voice coils are sort of lined up, not, not exactly, but closer than would happen with a horn loaded firing through. Um, I'm sorry. I screwed it up. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but once you do that, um, the off-axis performance just smoothly decays. There's no tonality, strong tonality changes. And so it definitely improves the speaker. And it's matching into a room. And it's off-axis as you, the tonality doesn't change too much as you move around. Um, so any type of concentric structure, that's where I was going, whether it's the dual concentric design or on top or whatever, they all offer those advantages. It's just, it's not that common. Um, and it's not common partly because it's more difficult to design. Um, you've got to get a lot of parameters right for that cone shape and the surround and the little horn in the middle to <coughs> optimize the response of the tweeter. And there's lots of tricks to, to getting that right. Okay. Let's try to squeeze in one really fast one. Sorry, we're kind of over time. Oh. Who? We got chosen to. Okay. From a room correction standpoint, is there a specific piece of software or hardware implementation that you like? And is Eli got any plans to put in the room correction into their amplifier or amp? So our amplifier, our two channel amplifier, already has room correction. All our subwoofers have room correction, but it's that simple type. You know, they're all low cost products. For these situations where you know it's not going to be put in the optimum position. So let's do something rather than nothing. I know when I was with Pioneer and we had all our receivers, first thing, any setup I went into at any show that anyone else had set up, first thing I'd do is turn off all the room EQ. Because they were kind of doing the wrong thing and letting it do up to too high a frequency. So first thing, turning off. I was known for that. Not a good way sometimes, uh -oh. but that's what I would always do. Um, so, other than that, no, I never really play with room EQ, because I'm just, basically I'm a two-channel guy. When I listen, even my movies at home are two-channel. Really? Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, me too. I love, I love Dolby Atmos. It's just I never bothered to set that up at home. Huh. But when I do it in the lab, in our listening room, you kind of sit down and think, why aren't I doing this all the time? Because it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that most of my listening at home, or well, seriously, is two channel. Yeah. I but think. A quick one from him. Oh, okay. Uh, I think I've seen the future in icon and controlling the signal from source to sound. And it seems to me that the hard leg of that trade is the speaker. And I see PS is trying to do it. <coughs> Can you speak to the almost inevitability from an engineer's perspective of having total control? Well, it's not new because Meridian have been doing it for 40 or more years. The only successful active speaker over the last nearly four decades has been Meridian because they control the whole process. And Bob and his team are wizards at DSP. So they've been doing all this kind of stuff. Maybe not quite to the degree of current technologies available in room correction, but they've been doing everything else forever. And they've been successful because they control the whole environment. Um, as DSP gets cheaper and more people understand it, there'll be more and more powered speakers that incorporate all these ideas. Uh, but it's still going to be quite a while because there's huge resistance to that complexity people like to mix and match. Yeah. Anyway, thanks everybody for coming. Thank Andrew Jones. <laughs> Don't all go back together at the same time to the listening room, because you're not going to be able to get in. <laughs>